Hi everyone, my name is Abby Adam. I am um, a class of 2022 um, junior at Gettysburg College. I am a, um, I am a history major and a public history minor. Um, today I'm here with Dr. James Martin. He's a history, a history professor at Marquette University and he's the author of The Children's Civil War. And today we'll be talking about his book. Um, so, Dr. Martin, would you be able to give the viewers kind of a brief background or a brief overview about your book? Sure. Um, I wrote it a long time ago. It was my second book, and I came to the topic um, from outside of, of the field of children's history. My first book was about Texas during the Civil War. Uh, I published that, got tenure, looking for a, another book-like project, as one does. And... I came across a couple of books. One was called Children of the City at Work and at Play by David Nassau. The other was by Elliot West called Growing Up with the Country, Children on the Far Western Frontier. Um, and I assigned them to a, a survey class I had. And it was a kind of a special survey class. It was a one semester US survey for elementary ed majors. It was one of their state requirements to be certified. And I paired them up. They wrote a paper about this and um, the women in this class, it was all women at that time in this class, really liked these books. Um, and so that was sort of a hint to me that maybe when I'm looking for a project, I should include childhood somehow. And I was actually thinking about doing a social history of Sherman's March. You know, so they'd see Sherman coming and see him going and how the population um, responded to that. And I thought I'd have a chapter about children uh, in that. But as the months went on, I started identifying sources and uh, looking at secondary materials, I realized I just really wanted to write a book about children during the Civil War. And I was fortunate because like five books came out about Sherman's March by the time I would, I would have been getting done. Um, so I went into it from that standpoint. There were no books about children during the Civil War, uh, not much written at all, uh, even in articles about them. But the sources were surprisingly rich. Um, just two examples. One is children's magazines, or magazines published for children and youth. There are 20 or 25 published around the Civil War era, uh, and they're awful to read. They're didactic and, and uh, uh, very 19th century moralistic, a um, uh, little stuffy, but they had lots of stuff about the war. Uh, and so I was able to have a whole chapter about children's literature, basically, uh, and the war. And, and the kinds of information um, and expectations that children got from those magazines. This is mainly Northern children, they're mainly published in the North. The other um, are letters from soldiers to their families. Now these are not new sources. Um, this has been a, a uh, that, 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 that kind of source has been uh, central to the study of Civil War soldiers since they were, that, since it began. But what was surprising is how nobody had talked about um, what soldiers were saying to their kids. Uh, and um, what one finds when you look at these is they still want to be dads. They want to be, they want to be fathers. They're giving advice. Uh, they're telling stories. They're providing extraordinary information about the war. Um, and so I went back, looked at both published and unpublished letters. I was very selective because that could have got away from me because I was doing Northern and Southern children um, of both races, white and black. Uh, and so I had to be pretty strict about my sources. Um, but I found some wonderful stories. And also wives writing to their fathers, writing to their husbands rather, because of course, what do they want to know about? They want to know about the kids, you know? And so I found a lot about the experiences of children through what mothers were telling fathers and what fathers were asking mothers and what they're telling their children. Uh, and so it became uh, a, a probably my favorite project that I've done. Uh, this is 20, probably 26 or seven years ago that I actually started the research. Um, and it, it was just really a fun research project. It felt very new because it was. Um, I didn't read a lot of secondary sources because there weren't any. I could jump right into the stories and the narratives. And so, um, so that's a, probably longer than you wanted, but that, that's sort of how I got started on it. Yeah, that's perfect. That sounds completely fascinating. I can't imagine um, how difficult it must have been to kind of pretty much establish that whole um, field of children's um, historiography for during the Civil War. So um, kind of on that note, do you, um, do you know how the historiography has changed since then? 
or do you know um, how kind of, since you started, you kind of were a pioneer of that whole, whole historiography, how would you say that that historiography kind of established the base for the continued study of children in the Civil War? Um, I think it might, the Children's Civil War might have had more impact on the side of children's history than on Civil War history in a way. There certainly have been other books about children and youth during the Civil War. Uh, and like in, in, in a, any topic, um, they narrowed it down. And so there's one about South Carolina, there's one about girls, you know, there's, there's articles about other places. And they, they're able, they, they've been able to do a deeper dive into those experiences than I was. Because I was doing, you know, a national study. Um, and so there's been a lot done, I think, um, to flesh out uh, and to find new um, topics about childhood. I don't, again, I don't know that it's shaped the historiography of the Civil War, maybe the home front up to a point. I think it probably fits in with uh, the historiography of women during the Civil War, for instance, you know, uh, because the lives of children and women were int intimately related, you know, during the Civil War. Um, and we know about it because for the same reasons, uh, in that people were writing letters in a way they hadn't written letters before. Uh, that's why we have all these sources. Guys were gone. They were gone for years sometimes. Uh, and, and, and so we we're able to do that. On the other side of, of my professional life, because since that time, I've maintained both research projects in children's history and in Civil War history. I moved on to veterans kind of with the Civil War, but I've stayed on the childhood side as well. And I you know, teach a class on children's history. I helped start an organization about uh, Society for History of Children and Youth. Um, and children in war is one, is a pretty important threat in children's history and, and, and youth history. Um, not only in terms of present day, it's a little bit less of a hot topic now, present day use of child soldiers uh, in various parts of the world, but also the, the effects on on children, the effect on policies, government policies related to children during wartime, World War II, World War I, um, and, and much farther beyond that as well. And so I think, um, I don't, I'm not gonna claim to have started that historiography with this book, because it was certainly something being looked at before. I think what I was able to do, and I would hope it's a little bit of a model, is that I was able to provide, because of my sources, some children's points of view. And that's hard to do in children's history. Most children's history is written about children rather than um, showing children as actors and as um, um, having agency uh, in their own histories. Uh, and again, because a wartime inspires the creation of documents that uh, includes children's voices, um, I was able to, I was able to do that. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. So kind of basing it off of, um, basing it off that topic, what would you say, would there have there been any particular sources, um, particularly sources by children or aimed at children that have been particularly interesting, would you say? For the children's civil war itself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, in terms of the, the, the Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of letters written by children that survived. I, I'm not quite sure why, because both fathers and mothers talk about the children writing letters. And there are a few. Um, because fathers, fathers will respond to questions children's asked, you know, or they'll actually write a letter to their wife, and then they'll have, here's a letter to John, here's one to Sarah, here's one, you know. Uh, I came across a great collection uh, at the Library of Congress uh, of a guy that, wrote to his wife very regularly and included a separate letter for all three sons. And they were like 13 or 14 and nine or 10 and four or five. And they were completely different. You know, the, the tone was different. The stories were different. What he was, his advice was different. Um, and so I wish I'd gotten their responses because he talked about how, how great their handwriting was. Or that he refers to their letters. Um, the, the children's magazines actually had some things from children from time to time, that letters being written into the editor, um, um, which I think is very familiar to modern day um, parents and children. 
there were um, a small number of, they're kind of called juvenile magazines, um, but they're self-published. And so they're magazines published by children. And they were things that would be, be uh, uh, distributed to their families or maybe their neighborhood. It's a very big deal after the Civil War. You can buy little tiny printing presses, you know, and there are hundreds, a whole, there's a national organization of amateur, you know, newspapers they're called. There's about 20 or 30 of them during the war. Um, and those were very interesting because you, what you had was, um, uh, they're mainly, I say they're like junior high, early high school in our, in our parlance um, for the most part. And they're really just copying the children's magazines. The, 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 the issues look like those magazines, the kinds of things they talk about uh, are the same things. Uh, it's entirely in the North, entirely the Northeast actually, Boston, New York, those areas. Uh, so it's very kind of biased set of sources, but they're very interesting in terms of getting points of view and, and just the language that young people have used in talking about the war. One of my favorites was a high school newspaper called the Athenium uh, in, 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 in a, I can't remember if it's Newark or Camden, New Jersey. I think it's Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and they were clearly mainly essays written for class. But this group of guys then would collect them into a monthly kind of newspaper, handwritten. So I have no idea how many copies they made. Uh, sometimes they'd have really elaborate drawings. They had a really good artist that was, that I don't know what her name was. Um, uh, and and th that, that was very interesting, uh, in fact. But another, again, not surprising and not original set of sources, but ones that hadn't been looked at for what I was hoping for were memoirs and reminiscences and diaries that were published. Uh, again, not a lot of diaries of children, but a few. Uh, but one of my um, strategies was to sort of identify famous people, you know, politicians or reformers or whatever, actors and actresses up to a point who had been children during the Civil War and just look up their reminiscences. Uh, and again, like all reminiscences, you have to be careful with them and, and kind of contextualize them. But they were extremely useful. Again, it hadn't been used for this purpose before. So that was kind of fun. Uh, what I did find, this is not surprising, um, is that there were a number of, <coughs> excuse me, Southern children, Southern adults, <coughs> who wrote whole books about their experiences during the Civil War, and they would add Reconstruction, because many of them were not only Civil War kids, they were Reconstruction kids, and that's a very different tale of fish in the South and the North. Northern reminiscences were almost entirely like the first chapter in my life during the Civil War, and they just talk about um, for 20, 30 pages, but there are a lot more of them uh, in the North, and so that became a really central part of uh, part of my narrative, but also part of the analysis of, of what their experiences were. Yeah, wow. That sounds um, definitely very interesting and like a very interesting um, methodology. It must have been very challenging to work with so few sources, to be sure. I had tons of sources, actually. You know, oh, I mean, okay. Sorry, was, I must have, must have misunderstood that. Yeah, there's so very few sources produced by children in the moment. Yeah, yeah. But I had plenty of sources and but just for instance, um, textbooks for schools. Because um, one of the, the, the first thing I thought I'd be doing is how did children find out about the war? Now I ex expand beyond that, but that became kind of a central way that I conducted my research. Um, and I don't know, it is for people your age, but one of the kind of classic things that shows up in surveys of the Civil War are Confederate math problems. You know, if one Confederate can kill seven Yankees, how many Yankees can seven Confederates kill? You know, and I found the textbook that appeared, appeared in. But there are about 100 textbooks or school books produced in the South for Southern children. Most of them were copies of Northern textbooks, literally word for word copies, with like the Confederate Constitution thrown in and just a few things. But some were like geographies that would have a very different take on on the world than Northern textbooks. Northern textbooks barely noticed the Civil War. Uh, during the war, it didn't change at all. After the war, somewhat. 
um, those are all available. They'd all been microfilmed, you know, so I was able to read those. The children's magazine are virtually all on microfilm. Uh, one of the things with the sources, I had tons of sources. Uh, I was on the road for six weeks entirely. Six weeks. All I had to be in archives because, you know, most things weren't archived that way around children. And so I just identified certain places I'd go and get everything I could there and fill in the rest with published uh, sources. And it was remarkable, you know, how, how much I was able to find. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. I'm surprised that there had been so few um, publications about children in the Civil War before then, because it sounds like there was such, it was um, ripe with information. Nobody cared about it. You know, no one had thought about it, I think. And, and that is kind of the, um, I was coming in at the beginning of a big rise in children's history in general. Um, and so that was important. Um, I think it's because there were a bunch of boomers that were becoming historians. And I always like to say that boomers love to talk about our own childhoods and our children's childhoods and our own children. And I had a at that time, it would have been about a 10-year-old and a two-year-old when I started, you know, working on this. Uh, and that's not why I did it, but I realized it was a little bit of a motivation, you know, for because it was very interesting just seeing how people dealt with their kids. And I certainly don't want to say that families and parents and children were, are the same then as they are now, because they were now. But boy, there were things you could find, you know, that were very similar. Um, I love the fact that I, soldiers were riding home laying guilt trips on their teenage children. Uh, there's one guy from Wisconsin, and he's kind of old for a, a soldier. He's lying in the mud in a trench in Virginia, and uh, his 15-year-old daughter is giving his, her stepmother problems. Uh, and at one point, he says, oh, I wish I had a pen instead of a pencil so that you could keep this letter forever. You could read it better. But... Here I am, lying in the mud and the cold, and I might die tomorrow, and yet you want to go to a dance. I mean, it was such a classic dad thing to do. Um, I like it. There's an Iowa mother, one of the first letters I found in a, in a published set of letters in, in Iowa, um, talking about all the trouble their two-year-old got into. And one of them being, got, he got into the stove. It was cold. I mean, the ashes were cold, so he didn't get hurt. But you just scatter them all over the place. Kind of, and you can, you can imagine how ashes are sticky, you know. And I was just imagining our, my two-year-old doing this. And so she kind of complained about him for, you know, half a page. And they said, but, you know, he's a caution for fun. And that's exactly how you think about toddlers. Anyway, and, and, and so the, there was this sense in that very fundamental way of identifying, you know, with the people in the stories and the sources, but also being part of this larger um, effort to get at the histories of children and youth. That wasn't a Civil War thing. It was on the other side, of, again, of my professional life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's been, a, it's been very um, important for both sides. I mean, that's, that's certainly my, my best known book is The Children of the Civil War. Um, and I think it, um, it was fairly effective for, for its time. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely sounds like that. So I guess, um, what remaining questions did your research raise for you? Um, you know, something that, um, this is, uh, the main one I think is how did the war affect people uh, who had grown up during it? And I, and I have a last chapter that talks about aftermaths. Um, and in it, um, I mean, I, I talk about African-Americans um, who had been slaves. One of the things I did do is go through it all 19 volumes, volumes of the American Slave, um, which is the oral histories taken in the 1930s. I had other sources too, but, and again, they are extremely problematic sources, but they were, but most of, most of the people interviewed, maybe not most, a large percentage of the people interviewed in the 1930s had just because of demographics been children or teenagers at least during the war. Now a slave teenager or child is not the same as a, a teenager living in middle class Boston, but they're still, you know, young uh, and they're remembering things in a certain way. And so I have a very significant section there just about the lives of African Americans who um, had been had been children during the war and, and how they how they believe the war affected them. 
and, 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 and so forth. And I did the same thing for white children in both sections as well, but it's hard to get at that. Um, that was very anecdotal. It was very much drawn from memoirs, obviously. Um, I talked a little about uh, Union and Confederate veterans trying to shape the narrative for children because both big organizations for those veterans had uh, campaigns to influence textbooks and how they're being written. Um, you know, you, you probably heard of Children of the Confederacy, you know, as a offshoot of um, um, United Confederate, United Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, things like that. Um, and so I think the questions that I could suggest some things about without coming to conclusions, I think, is, is this how growing up during a war affects children and youth. Because most people don't write about that. Um, so the sources are relatively limited. Children's magazines stopped talking the Civil War in 1866 or 67. Uh, as I said, Northerners don't really talk about the aftermath at all uh, in their memoirs. Um, it just isn't a big deal uh, to them. Uh, and so I don't know if, it, if that qu question is answerable, you know, but it is, it is I think, the thing that um, I was left wondering about. Yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to see, um, I guess how that question kind of can change, or I guess not that question, but I guess the answer to that question can kind of modify over time. Cause it doesn't seem like there really can be at least at the moment, a, um, complete consensus on something like that because, uh, yeah, definitely. It seems a lot of the time because of how after the civil war, of, of course, um, like you said, the, the North was more kind of like, oh, okay, it's, it's done, you know, but then the South was probably more focused on reconstruction after the Civil War. Maybe what you get from the Southerners are what they think about race, you know, mm -hmm. as they were growing up. And, um, and there are some very famous um, arch segregationists from the early 20th century who were children during the war. And that was kind of useful, interesting. I think one, one, one avenue might be uh, one of my favorite memoirs is by a woman named Anna Howard Shaw. Does that name ring a bell with you? Anna Howard Shaw. I don't believe it does. She's pretty famous. I didn't know her, you know, before I came across this. But she took over the women's suffrage movement, one of the organizations after the turn of the century. She's also a doctor. Oh. Uh, but she grew up in the frontier of Michigan. And um, it was grueling. They had moved there just before the war. They're, they were 60 miles to the nearest railroad. And their father and the oldest brothers all went off to work, leaving you know them with a few small kids and her mom and a couple of sisters to run a farm. Um, they didn't have any money. It's a grueling and awful you know life. And she talks about it that way. I mean, she's writing this after. I'm. A, I think the publication date was the 19 teens, because um, I think she was 18 when the war ended. Uh, and it's all on her and the women. And this is how she approaches it. Now, of course, she's had 50 years of women's rights activism to shape how she's interpreting her own life. Um, and uh, one gets the sense that, and this isn't just something you have to into it. She really says this almost point blank, that my experience during the war um, was so brutal that it committed her to women's rights because they had none. And, you know, and she loved her father, but he was kind of this idealistic and romantic character um, who just had to be in, in, in the middle of everything. And he, she blamed him for their hardship. I mean, she was so mad at him 50 years later uh, for deserting them, basically, um, that she could hardly stand it. But I think um, she felt that I know one of the last lines of that chapter when she describes it is that the emancipation of the slaves and then the war also emancipated me. That's a paraphrase. But so I think things like that, I, I, I have a feeling that if you took a really deep look at how women's rights activists looked at their childhoods, because they're always about her age, uh, that might be able to tell you something. You know, I haven't done that, you know, but I, I think that might be a, an important thread. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so I guess, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, 
No, I don't think so. I mean, um, I think we, we covered the most important parts of the book. Uh, uh, as I said, it was um, a very fun thing to do. It's, 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 it was hard, uh, but um, I don't think I've done anything else that I felt like I was out there by myself in a way, in a very good way, um, doing. So that was enjoyable and, and, and meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. That sounds like sounds like your um, research was absolutely fascinating, and very intriguing, and it sounds like, it, gosh, I have to buy a copy for the book myself. <laughs> Good. Everybody should. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.